Hi, this is Maria Olson. You may know me from Trophy Heads or Starry Eyes and maybe Paranormal Activity 3. And I want to welcome you to Anthony T's Horror Show because it's an awesome show. Hi, my name is Jessica Cameron and you're listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Hey, fellow horror fans. This is Troy Escamella, the director of Party Night and Mrs. Claus. And you are listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Enjoy. Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm Anthony T. In this edition, I will be talking to actress Sarah French about her latest film, Root Wood, and a couple of other upcoming projects that she has. And also, I will be finally talking about Glenn Danzig's Veronica. And yes, this is probably something that you should hear because this is probably one of the longest rants that I've ever done on a film review. And let me tell you that this segment goes over 10 minutes, which probably leads you to believe that I really have a lot to say about this film, and it is not good. Trust me. But that's at the end of the episode. But first, I want to Talk a little convention news. As yet another convention that yours truly was looking forward to. And actually, I was actually looking forward to meeting some of these people. Because Doc Discussions was originally going to have a booth at Scares That Carrier Weekend 7. But that convention has been postponed till next year. As they announced that... Gears That Care Weekend 7 will be taking place July 30th through August 1st, 2021. So that means next year. So I was really looking forward to going to this convention this year. It had a really good lineup. It had a Rocky Horror Picture Show reunion, which I'm always down for. But it is really sad that this convention isn't going to happen this year. And quite frankly, I don't think any convention in the New England area, at least, will happen this year. It's just sad. But we're living under difficult circumstances at the moment. I'm hoping next year will be a better year for conventions, because I really miss the convention scene this year, as it's really usually one of my favorite times of the year, from June to November. But I quite frankly don't see any conventions happening this year. Now, Skiz that care recently are looking to raise money for this year's recipient families. And they've come up with the idea of producing a shirt to raise money for those families. The shirts are $20, but $10 from each shirt will go to the recipient families i definitely recommend you purchase one i know times are tough i purchased one because i'm a supporter of the charity but it's going to a good cause if you can spare 20 dollars, please do as it would help some recipients family out with medical bills but if you have spare money i really suggest you help scares that care because usually they make the bulk of the money for the recipients at the convention but since there's no convention this year it's going to be difficult if you don't want to even buy the shirt and still want to donate to scares that care you can go to scares that care.org and help this year's family recipients out and with that that's the news 
Besides Anthony T's Horror Show, you can also listen to these other fine podcasts on the Doc Discussions Network. Doc Discussions, hosted by Phil Perone and Michael Darwin. You Know Nothing, Jon Snow, a Game of Thrones podcast. Bullets, Brothels, and Bots, a Westworld podcast. Halloween Boutique, Psychotronic Reviews. And Searching for American Gods. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and Doc Discussions is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Every day there's a family struggling with hospital bills to care for their sick child who is fighting an illness. There's a woman who is fighting breast cancer and is having trouble making ends meet while paying for their treatment. And there are burn victims that are going through treatments to heal their deep wounds. There is a charity in the horror community that helps these people. Scares That Care is an organization that helps families deal with the bills for their child. They help women get the treatment they need to fight breast cancer and they help people who are dealing with severe burns get the help they need to heal. Scares That Care is a 100% volunteer organization and 501c3 nonprofit charity that is dedicated to helping these people in fighting real monsters. To find out more information or to donate to Scares That Care, you can go to www.scaresthatcare.org. Every donation helps Scares That Care fight real monsters. Hey guys, this is Steven Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic-Con coverage all around? Well then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributors. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. Welcome back. I'm here with actress Sarah French, one of the up and coming B movie actresses out there today. She's been in such films as Automation, Rootwood, Blind. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi. Thanks for having me. What made you get into the film business? Um. I don't know. I guess looking back, I've always wanted to entertain people. I mean, as a kid, I would, you know, put on little plays with my sister and, you know, we were just really creative and, you know, it it followed me into my teenage years. I would make little movies with my friends, a lot of horror movies. Um, I still have them, I think, somewhere. (laughs) I don't know if I'd ever want to show anyone, but (laughs) it was something fun. You know, we weren't into drugs or drinking or anything, and that that was our, you know, it was just great to be able to create, and we had a video camera and all that, and that also followed me into my early 20s when I went to college. I actually went to college for criminal justice originally, um, because I've always been interested in that, but, you know, some classes we were able to take acting classes in between, like um, electives, I think that's what you call it. I don't know. Um, but I would take some acting classes while I was studying for criminal uh, criminal justice. And I, I kind of found my love for that even more doing that, just being able to perform in front of an audience. Uh, it was theater mostly. Um, but that's kind of where it all started. And then I was at a concert <clears throat> with a friend and I'm a metal girl. I'm into metal music. And it was a metal show. And I back then I dressed gothic alternative. Uh, this photographer came up to me and he's like, hey, I really like your look. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think we should shoot sometime. And I looked at him like he was crazy. <laughs> I was like, wait, who is this dude? I was like, OK, I'll take your card, whatever, buddy. You know, and uh, it took about six months and I found the card. And I was, I was like, oh, maybe I'll give this a try. You know, give this a try. 
I contacted him, set up a shoot, and I kind of just, I loved performing in front of the camera as a model. Six months after that, I gained, from doing that, I gained a lot of confidence because I didn't have a whole lot of self-confidence. Um, and that actually really opened everything up for me. Um, and it, it was really weird, but I went, uh, I searched online and there was a, um, I guess it was like MySpace or something. And they were casting for a horror film, a short horror film in Minnesota where I'm from. Uh, it was called Pajama Party Massacre. And, you know, they were looking for um, some cast. And I, I checked it out. I was like, okay, this this sounds fun. Uh, I met the filmmakers at a uh, coffee shop. They liked my attitude. They're like, you are the Jennifer character. And they basically hired me right on the spot. And that was in 2006. And I've been acting in films since then. So I've been doing this a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you used to go under the name Scarlet Salem. How yes. did you come up with that name? That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, not, not a lot of people, a, a lot of my, you know, old school fans know that name. A lot of, you know, newer fans don't know that name. But w- when I first got into modeling, uh, my photographer, he told me that every model and actress had a stage name. And, you know, I, I didn't know anything about the industry. I, I didn't have friends. I didn't have anybody that was in the industry. So I didn't know any better. I was like, Oh, really? I was like, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'll come up with a stage name. So he kind of helped me craft the stage name. Again, I'm a metal girl. I'm a horror girl. Always have been. So he's like, why don't you, you know, pick a name that you can, um, pick that's more horror related because that's what I love. So I guess scarlet came from the color of inside of uh, coffins, like scarlet red. And it's, you know, scarlet's a pretty name. And then Salem, well, Salem, Salem, Massachusetts, the witch trials, you know, it's, it just sounded cool. So scarlet Salem, that's where that came from. And then I used it. I used that name from 2006 to 2011. Um, and I wanted to kind of burst out into the, um, industry and not just do horror films. I love horror. Horror is like my favorite thing to do, but I also love doing other things. Um, I like dramas, uh, comedies, actions. I mean, I just wanted to do everything. So I didn't want to just pigeonhole myself into just doing horror. And, if, and, you know, looking back, if I was to keep that name, people would just know me as, you know, a horror a horror actress and I'm more than that. You know, I, I like doing everything. Now, one of the first films that I saw you in was terror overlord. Yeah. Terror overload. (laughs) That was a, that was a fun movie. (laughs) How do you come up, come upon that project? Well, um, like I said, my first film was pajama party massacre. That's actually where I met Joe Netter, who is my boyfriend and he was, you know, he wasn't my boyfriend at the time. That's where we met. We met on my very first movie. He wrote the script and he played the killer in it. So we struck up a really good, really like friendship relationship. Um, we really clicked. He, you know, he was great. He kind of showed me the ropes on, you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, cause I was so green when I first started, you know, I didn't know anything. Like I said, I had no friends, nothing in the industry. So I was just coming into this like blind. <laughs> So um, he was kind of my mentor, you know, when I first started. And um, so we did Pajama Party Massacre. And I think a year later, we did Terror Overload. Joe also wrote that. He uh, plays the killer in it as well. Um, and it was by the same filmmakers that did Pajama Party Massacre. It was NFTS Productions out of St. Paul, Minnesota. So so they liked what we did for uh, Pajama Party Massacre. So they wanted to cast me in their next movie, which was Terror Overload, which is an anthology film. It's it's a lot of fun. It's it's cheesy. Um, it's you know it's a B movie fun fun film. I think it was like my second or third movie that I ever did. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's I guess that's where that all started. What was it like being stuck filming inside a truck for that film? Oh yeah. Well, we're in the wraparound. We're the wraparound story, basically. Um, yeah, you're right. Most of the 
most of our stuff was in a semi. Uh, Joe's character, he's a semi driver. He picks me up on the side of the road because I was stranded. And then he's telling me all these scary stories. Um, and at the end, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but yeah, it, there's kind of a twist at the end. And, but, um, it was a lot of fun. I've, I've never been in a semi before and I was like, Oh, this is great. <laughs> we had, we had, we had a really good time filming that, you know, and, and like I've, I've, I talk about this a lot, but the industry is really hard. It's hard to find true friends. It's really hard to find people that you can really just click with and trust. And, um, you know, it, you kind of create this family, you know, when you're working on these movies and we, you know, like I was saying, Joe and I really clicked at the time we clicked with the, you know, the filmmakers, a lot of our friends were working on the, the film at the time and it's like a family. Um, and with that being said, that was like, my movie blind, which I'll talk about, uh, I'm sure in this interview as well. It's just about working together with good friends and, you know, making those connections. It's, it's so important. And it really comes across on screen as well. I think, especially when you're working close knit with all these people, if you can feel that connection, that trust, I think that really helps you as an actor to, you know, be your best and do your best. You also got to work with the great Sid Haig on a film called Death House a couple of years ago. What was it like getting a chance to work with a legendary actor like Sid? Sid was so amazing. Uh, our scene was small in Death House, very small. But just being able to share the screen with him, even for a minute, was amazing. I mean, I knew Sid before then just a little bit. He's actually more... He's Joe. He was one of Joe's really good friends. Um, and I met him on the convention circuit because we did, you know, some conventions. Um, so I was able to meet Sid at different conventions. So I, I knew him. So that was nice. Uh, and it was just great to share the screen with him. He is he's such an amazing actor and such a beautiful person. Um, I'll never forget that. I mean, it was just such a great experience. He, Sid is just so he was so full of life. And, you know, he gave such a great performance no matter what. Um, so it, it was really great to see him and how he worked the room and worked the camera and, um, you know, just just being in the same room with him and on screen together was an amazing experience. Speaking of conventions, you and your boyfriend, Joe, were regulars at Rock and Shock for years. Yes. Which sadly is no more. I Tell know. me what is one of your favorite memories of that convention? Well, there are a ton. <laughs> but um the thing I loved about Rock and Shock was of course all the people. We made so many friends over the years. Um we Joe was attending that convention long before we got together. I think he was he's been doing that convention for like 15 years. But when we got together, uh, I started doing it with him. So he already had this report with all these people and knew everyone. And um, it was just a big party over the years. Um, I would say, oh, the thing I love about Rock and Shock is not only the convention, but they also have the concerts at the Palladium. So you could attend the convention during the day and then you could go see it, you know, shows at night. And it was just so cool. Um, one of my favorite bands played there. Uh, what year was it? I think it was 2013. Uh, it was Typo Negative. But they played there. And what was great was um, one of my favorite memories. I mean, there's a ton, but because Typo Negative is like, one of my favorite bands, this was a big deal for me. We went to see them after the show, and they let us down in the front. So we were literally in the front barricade. So we were watching them. I was like maybe a three feet from Peter Steele. And I love Peter Steele. And I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then we were able to go behind and on the stage. So I was able to watch one of my favorite bands on the side stage. And that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life to, to this day. Um, so, and I thank Rock and Chuck for that, especially Gina, because 
Gina hooked us up to the max and I'm going to miss that show so much. And I really hope, you know, we get something like that again. Um, and if we don't, we don't, that's okay. But we have those wonderful memories we can always cherish. And I'm going to miss everyone so much, but we will definitely be back in the East coast again for, um, for something. So it won't be the last time, but yeah, a great show. And I'm really going to miss it. Yeah. That was also a great show too. Had a re- couple of really good memories from that, well, that show. Yeah, that's where I met you, Anthony. Yes. You're actually, I think, um, my, uh, on the, I believe around the early episode, earlier episodes of my podcast, actually. We really? Oh my. Bit. I, bl- I, I, believe. I think you're right. Yeah, I, I would love to hear that because <laughs> it's been so many years, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's been a couple of years, but at least I've gotten better. <laughs> that first oh, you're great. show was a learning experience. Hey, they all are. It's that you just got to keep doing it because that's the only way you learn more and get better, and that goes for anything. True. Well, let's move on to your latest film, Rootwood. Yeah. Tell everyone about that film and the character that you play. Well, I play Aaron. Um, I'm a really, I'm more of like a millennial. Uh, I'm all about my phone, you know, uh, talking to the phone and, you know, I'm just the typical millennial, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, very, a very bubbly character. Uh, she's a lot of fun, but she can be a pain in the ass, <laughs> as you will see in the movie. And by the way, Rootwood is out now on Amazon. Uh, and uh, other sites as well as DVD. But so basically it follows two students. Uh, they have a podcast called The Spooky Hour. Uh, it's played by Alyssa Dowling and Tyler Gallant, two of my really great friends, by the way, uh, directed by Marcel Walls, great friend as well. Um, uh, so it follows them and they meet this producer and this producer wants them to uh, do a documentary on the uh, something called The Curse of the Wooden Devil. So they're like, okay, you know, they saw their chance to become famous. So they're like, okay, we got to do this documentary, see what happens, check out what's going on in this forest. Uh, so they decide to invite their friend along, which is me. Uh, and we all enter Rootwood Forest together. So it's kind of this, um, it's, there's some elements of found footage, but it's a mostly cinematic film. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess it just follows us looking around to see what it is, see what's happening. Uh, You know, weird things do happen throughout the film. Um, It's very beautifully shot film. We shot it in, um, where was that? It was in Malibu. It was Malibu Creek Park. Oh, my gosh, it was so beautiful. You saw the film, right, Anthony? Yes. I mean, those shots, oh, it was so amazing. The whole process was amazing. But um, so, yeah, it's. It's something you have to see. Do we find out that there's something? Is there something? Is there something else? So it's 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 a fun film. Speaking of uh, filming the film, one of the things that I noticed you, uh, Tyler, and Elisa, was the fact that you had this ear device piece on you yes. while you were yes. acting. What was the device and who came up with the idea for you to wear it? Well, I believe that was part of the script. Uh, Mario, uh, he, I believe that was in the script. So screenwriter Mario, I, I believe that was part of the script. Um, it was just because we're documenting everything. So wherever we went, whatever we did, we had to have, it was just another camera. So there's three different looks in the film. There's the cinematic. There's the found footage, but cinematic look. And those were the earpieces or, or the, the headpieces we were wearing because we were documenting everything. And then there was just the phone footage, which was from the phone. Now, what was it like wearing that headpiece while you were acting at the same time? Oh, um, it was fine. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we just put it on our ear, kind of like a Bluetooth type thing. Um, But, yeah, it it wasn't no problem at all. Yeah, it's amazing how you can film various ways these days. Whether it's earpieces, iPads, drones. 
it's amazing how far we've come with technology. Yeah, the technology, I mean, really has exploded over the years. I mean, it's insane. People are making movies on their phones. Like, who would have saw that coming? <laughs> I, I didn't see it coming. Right? The, I didn't even see make films being shot with drones. Yeah, it's really it's it's really a crazy world we're in now, but it's it's really opened a lot of doors. Um, the tech with the technology, I think, and um, you know, has made it I think better overall. You know, just what? like anything. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with Alyssa Dowling and Tyler Gillant in all your scenes in the film? Well, we had a really great time. Alyssa's been my friend. Jeez. Four, four or five years now. So we've we've worked on numerous projects together. So we were uh, very close. Um, and so this was just you know, another walk in the park for us. Um, I didn't I didn't really know Tyler at the time. This was our first movie that we worked together on. I met him a few other times at some small parties. We talked a couple times, but I didn't really know him. So before we started shooting this film because we're basically the three main people in the movie. So we really had to get along together. Like we were really good friends because we are in the film. So we didn't really have much time for rehearsals, but we did get a day in for rehearsals and we all met together to kind of get a feel for each other, read the script and all that. Uh, And we all just really clicked well. And that's one thing in a lot of reviews that you see of Rootwood coming out is that the cast all really meshed well together and they all felt like really good friends because, well, we are. And we became even better friends working on this film together. And like I said, when you're working in movies, you really, you create this family setting. I mean, it, you all just, cause you're always, especially in the independent world, we always have to, you know, work together because if you don't work together, it just creates such a problem. Um, you know, there were no egos on set. There was, no fighting. I mean, we all just worked really well together and I'm so thankful and grateful. And that's what I love about our director, Marcel Walls. Uh, I didn't really know him much before blind, uh, Rootwood. And I met him the year prior and we, we met and hung out a few times and he asked if I wanted to be a part of Rootwood and check out the script and if I liked the character. Um, and you know, I said yes because I really enjoyed the script and I liked everything about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like one big family. And like I said, when you're working in the independent world, you have to almost become that because we don't have all the resources that everybody else does. There's usually only 10 people tops, a minimal cast, minimal crew. So we all have to really be on our A game and really work together. And since then, I've worked with Alyssa on multiple other projects. I've worked with Tyler on multiple, multiple projects. Uh, you know, I'm great friends with them. I, you know, now I, I train at the gym with Tyler. Like we're really good friends. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love it. We, we just had such a blast. The majority of the film takes place in the woods. What is it like filming day and night at that location? Insane. <laughs> when you're out in the elements, it's, it's, it can be crazy. Uh, Sometimes you don't have internet because you're in the middle of nowhere, (laughs) Um, which is good because then you can just focus on what you're there to focus on (laughs) and don't get distracted. Um, What's great for me is I'm a huge outdoorsy person. I love hiking. I love running. I love walking. I'm, if I can't be outdoors, I'm like depressed. (laughs) So being able to work in the forest was amazing. So in between, if I didn't have another scene for like hours later, I'd be like, all right, guys, I'm going to go for a jog. I'm going to go hiking. Um, I'll be back in like an hour, which probably wasn't the best idea because where we were, Malibu Creek Park, I mean, there's bears, there's uh, coyotes, there's mountain lions. I'm pretty ballsy when it comes to that kind of stuff. But uh, looking back, I probably should have been a little more careful. Cause I was all by myself doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, getting back to that, the elements are tough to work in because you can't control when it rains, when it's windy, you know, 
it's it's very difficult, but we got really lucky. Um, at night it got super cold. I think it got down to like thirties. And I know being from the East Coast and the Midwest, thirties is warm, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you're in California, thirties is like freezing, especially at night. So you know, and we're we're wearing you know shorts tank tops, stuff like that to make it look like it's, you know, to make it look like it's warm out when it's actually freezing. Um, I got to give props to Alyssa for this because I didn't have a lot of night scenes, but she did. Like, there's scenes where her and Tyler are running all over the forest and um, stuff like that. It was freaking freezing. Some nights were raining. I mean, let me tell you, this industry is not for everyone. It is not you get your own trailer, you get your own, you know, this and that. Like, we're, I mean, you, you, we're balls deep in this shit. (laughs) And and you have to have tough skin to do this. I'm telling you, you have to have tough skin to work in this industry because, you know, not only that, we're working sometimes 10, 18 hour days. I mean, <laughs> it can be intense and work, working outdoors is tough, but there's also a lot of reward to it. It's beautiful. It's relaxing. It's, it's, it's just, God, it was just great. I, I love it. I love it. With that being said, I also did this other movie called uh, desert moon. It's a werewolf film. I don't know if you saw that. Um, it's on my IMDb. You can uh, look it up, but uh, we don't have a trailer for that yet. Hopefully soon we'll hear some news on that one as well, but it's freaking awesome. But real quick, we shot in the desert for that. We were all just desert, no trees, uh, nothing. So the weather for that was insane. <laughs> but But yeah, whenever you're shooting in the elements, it's always hard. So just know that going into it. Some days it'll be ni- nice and sunny. Other days it'll be cold and rainy. So you just got to be prepared. Which was the worst, shooting in the woods or shooting in the desert? The desert, 100%. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. It was bad. Like, I love the movie, and I'm so grateful. It was such a grateful experience, but holy shit. We were living in the desert. We had, um, gosh, we had trailers. Uh, for that. And so at night when we were done shooting, we would you know, sleep in the trailers, but there was really no heat or anything. And it, in the desert, it gets down to like 20 degrees. I mean, the desert's crazy. Some nights it'll snow, rain, uh, high winds. That could all happen in one night. <laughs> That's crazy. In the desert. God, when did we shoot that? We shot that last year. Wait, what month is it? We're in May, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we started shooting that, I think, 1st of May or something like that, or end of April. And, yeah, the weather was insane. So I would definitely say the desert's much harder to work in. The forest, you know, you just got to deal with the the crazy wildlife. And, you know, (laughs) (laughs) let me tell you for Rootwood real quick. uh, One of the nights we were shooting overnight and... Uh, we had a park ranger that would come by every uh, few hours to make sure we were okay if we needed help or whatever. And one of the nights he came by and he said, just so you guys know, there was a black bear spotted about uh, a mile or two away. And my director, Marcel's like, oh, so can you come with us to where we're shooting? And he goes, nope, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, they were... I didn't have to shoot that night, but poor Alyssa and our DP, Thomas Rist and Marcel, they all went up the, uh, to this place where we had to shoot, like, a pivotal scene. And, yeah, there was a, a wild bear running around. <laughs> <laughs> and even the park ranger was like, fuck that. <laughs> it's like, I ain't messing with that. I'm like, dude, we're paying you. Assist us. <laughs> We've got to get back on track. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, it was crazy, but I I love it because you know we come we get stories like this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> true stories. Now back to Rootwood. What was your favorite moment on set of that film? Oh my god, these questions are always tough for me because it's like 
I, I've said this in a lot of interviews, but it's like having kids. You, what's your favorite kid? You, you usually, I don't know if parents can usually choose a favorite kid, but <laughs> it's always hard to choose your favorite because there's so many great memories. Um, uh, I guess just not to pick a specific memory, but just the overall experience was memorable. It was just, I had so much fun. And that's where I really clicked with Marcel. Marcel and I are best friends now. Um, and we can, we can actually transition this into blind because, uh, he, two years later we shot blind. Um, and it just, it just, we just really clicked. Marcel's such a great director. He, he knows exactly what he wants and he works with the actors so closely. He listens to us. He helps us with anything we need. Um, I'm so grateful for him. And he's such, he's just so good at what he does. Um, so I would say my favorite experience is just making friends and family from that experience. Now, speaking of Marcel, what makes him different from other directors that you've worked with? Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> Because I've worked with so many amazing people. I've met so many wonderful people that are so passionate about what they do. And I would say that's what it is. Marcel was meant to do this. That That is without a doubt, in my mind, what makes him different. He's, he's just so passionate, friendly. He's, he listens to us. He... And he, he just has such a vision. He's a visionary director. He adds so much beauty to everything that he works on. Um, especially, you know, and he has such a, oh, that's another good, that's another thing. He's great at setting up teams. Marcel is so good at getting, putting the right people together to make something work so well. He's just, he, he's just, this is what he's meant to do. And he's just so passionate and that, that helps us, um, you know, be our best we can be because, you know, with his support, um, it helps us. And there, there's directors out there who are just complete assholes. They don't care what they're doing. They just want the shot and move on. And trust me, I get that. But at the same point, you're doing this for a reason. You have to really, um, get what you're looking for and get it right and not just move on. And you have to pay close attention to detail. And that's what he does. Now you're also going to be starring in Marcel Walsh's next film blind. Yes. Tell everyone uh, about that film. Well, we actually finished shooting that last year. Um, and uh, it's actually going to be coming out sometime this year. We don't have dates. We can't announce anything yet, but it's going to look good for this year. Uh, basically, it's a film about a Hollywood actress. She's at the height of her career. She just finished her film Fog Storm. Uh, it was a, her biggest action-packed movie she's ever worked on. She bought a house in the Hollywood Hills, a beautiful glass house. You could see the Hollywood sign from it. It's amazing. Uh, so while she's at the height of her career, she decides to get laser eye surgery because she's sick of wearing glasses and contacts all the time. While things go horribly wrong... And she winds up blind. So it's, you know, it's about her putting pieces back together, trying to figure out her life, you know, going, uh, it's basically a fresh start and the troubles and the hardships she's going through while dealing with all this. And what she doesn't realize is there's somebody stalking her. So that's, I guess, basically the gist of it. Um, it's, it's more of a dramatic piece, I would say, than anything. There are horror elements in it, um, but it's more of a dramatic film noir um, thriller. I mean, we've what's funny is uh, we did the film circuit last year, and gosh, we've won in categories film noir, thriller, uh, horror, drama. What was the other one? There was one more. But <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to label exactly what it is because it's so unique. Uh, and I love that. That's what I love about it. Um, so Joe Netter, my boyfriend, he wrote it and Marcel directed it. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was kind of just all of us friends getting together. It was our Taco Tuesday group. 
because out here in LA, like I was saying, it's hard to find true friends, friends that you can really count on, friends that are there for you, no matter what circumstance you're in. Um, so a lot of people just like to use you. And then if they can't use you anymore, they're gone. Um, and that's where we're really grateful that we have the friends that we can count on and trust. And, and we're all in the entertainment industry and we all have our own, uh, things that we're good at. Um, so we all kind of just came together to make this movie. Um, so Marcel had a dream. I'll just tell it real quick kind of how it started. Marcel had a dream one night of a girl being stalked in a house in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and he was filming it, I believe, in the dream. And he woke up the next morning. Oh, and she was blind. He woke up the next morning. He wrote down the word blind. He went for a walk and... That later that day, I called him. I said, Hey, you want to come over, watch some, you know, movies and have some pizza? So we came over and, uh, 10 minutes watching this movie, Joe had to shut it off because his OCD kicked in and he had to throw away the pizza boxes. <laughs> and Marcel looks over at me. He's like, You know, I had this really crazy, crazy dream the other night. I dreamt about this girl being stalked in the Hollywood Hills. And, and Joe heard that. And Joe, the writer, you know, he's an amazing writer. He stood up and he's like, wait a second. And then he's paced around the apartment. And and that's kind of how it all started. Those two were giving out ideas. And uh, and Marcel looks over at me. He goes, and you could play the blind girl. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, I was like, okay, you know, we'll see. So that's kind of how it all started. And we decided to have all of our friends work on this wonderful, beautiful project together. And I'm so grateful for it. And let me mention, so the night they came up with the idea, five weeks to that day, we finished uh, principal photography. So it was five weeks from uh, writing the script or idea, script, filming, pr- uh, end of production. Five weeks. Wow. <laughs> you don't yeah. hear about that these days. No. For films. Especially, especially in the independent world. But we're very fortunate and lucky to have uh Two wonderful producers, uh, three wonderful producers on the project, uh, that believed in it, believed in us, and wanted to see this come to life. And that's, that really helped us because we, you know, we got really lucky with that. We already had a team. Uh, Thomas Riss, who DP'd Rootwood, also DP'd Blind. So we brought a lot of people back from Rootwood to work on Blind. Uh, Kwame Head, who did the special effects in Rootwood and played the monster. He also did the makeup and special effects in Blind. Um, Tyler Gallant, who was uh, in Rootwood, came back for Blind. Um, I mean, and all the people that worked behind the scenes came back for Blind. So, like I said, Marcel's really good at setting up um, teams, and he knows what works, and he's fast. That's another thing. Marcel's so fast. Um you know, even though it is a small production, minimal, again, minimal cast and crew and budget, he's able to create something so beautiful, uh, a beautiful end product that we all can enjoy and love. And it's coming out quick. I mean, like I said, we finished it last year. It hit the Film Fest circuit, which did really well. We won 21 awards, which was amazing. And I'm so grateful for it. Um, and it's going to be coming out sometime this year. So we're I don't know. I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm, fa- I'm thankful for all of them. I'm thankful for my boyfriend, Joe. He wrote a beautiful script, one that one that challenged me and one that really spoke to me. It, it, it really that character that I play, Faye, in Blind really was a challenge, but it really kind of broke me out of what I've my comfort zone. Um, and I'm just so thankful for it. And I can't wait for everyone to see it. So I'll definitely keep everyone posted when that one comes out. Besides that film, what other upcoming projects that you have that are either in the works or heading to DVD and VOD in the future? Well, um, let's see. Well, the next film I'm working on, well, I guess I could talk about uh, a movie that actually just won an award at the LA, LA Film Awards. We actually just won over the weekend. Uh, best crime film, uh, Booze, Broads, and Blackjack. Actually, it's a non-horror film. Shocker. <laughs> um, I play a really cool character in that. Um, 
I'm basically playing like the Sharon Stone of cas- of Casino in that film. It's not the same, but it's kind of similar. Um, and that one has Vincent Pastor, uh, James Duvall, Felissa Rose. I mean, an amazing cast. A lot of great people involved in that one. Um, and like I said, it's a mobster film. So that one should be coming out, I'm hoping, sometime this year. We had, we had a screening for it last year in um, New York, and it, it went really well. Um, it's, it's based on a novel by Carl Nikita. He, uh, wrote, he also wrote the screenplay to the movie too. Uh, but that one should be coming out. So we actually did, um, the, uh, the trailer is online. You can look up Booze, Broads, and Blackjack. Uh, so yeah, so that one should be coming out. Um, what else? What else is there? Uh, oh, I did, I did a film last year called Bridge of the Doomed. That one's like an army. Um, I would say it's like a army, uh, the army meets Night of the Living Dead. So it's like a zombie film, but it has, really has to do with, um, something like a creature living under this bridge and the army has to, uh, try to get past this bridge because that's their only way to get over to help, uh, refugees. And, um, so that one should be coming out this year. That one's a lot of fun. That one had, uh, who, oh, who's all in that one? Uh, uh, Michael Perret. Robert Lasardo, Tara Reid. Oh, was Tara Reid in that one? No, she's in the next one. Uh, but great cast in that one too. That one should be coming out actually at this, what were they saying? They were saying at, uh, this fall. Um, so yeah, a handful of stuff coming out. I guess those are the main ones. Automation. That one's out now. You can watch that on Amazon Prime. Melissa Dowling's in that one as well with me. Definitely check um, that film out. Yeah, it's, it's, I believe, uh, on, Free on Prime if you have it. It's like a, a killer robot, you know, type movie. It's a lot of fun. It's a. Uh, it's also uh, a Christmas movie as well. Yes, yes, because it does take place around Christmas. Technically. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. Um, Art of the Dead. That one is out as well. You can look that up. I think that's yeah, on I've Amazon Prime that. as well. Yep, yep. I think that's. Oh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. That one we haven't talked about yet, have we? Uh, no, we haven't actually. Yeah, Joe um, Hanukkah. It's basically a, a Jewish slasher film. Um, that one, Joe plays the killer in that one, the Hanukkah killer. And, that. And if I'm correct, it's the last film roles of Dick Miller and Sid Haig. Yes. As well. Yes, yes, and they were amazing in the movie. So amazing. Um, you know, it's. It was great to have them. I didn't work one-on-one with them, but uh, just being able to be in a film with them. I mean, I have a small part in it, but I'm really grateful to be a part of it because it's, you know, the movie's really well done. It's 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 great. And plus, I got to, you know, do a, a scene with Joe again. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, I think the only other movie we worked on together was uh, uh, Strip Club Slasher. But actually, now that I think about it, Terror I did a role. Terror Overload, too. Yep. Terror Overload was before that. Um, I also did this movie called Barry, uh, which Joe is actually in too. That one's, uh, it's like, it's a romantic comedy, but with a horror twist in it. And I don't want to give anything away, but you can actually look up the trailer online. It's basically, uh, uh, has something to do with a big teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> That one actually might be coming out this year. Oh, and of course, Desert Moon, which I mentioned earlier. Desert Moon, the werewolf film, which I don't know if I mentioned, Joe wrote the screenplay to that as well. Thomas Haley directed that, who is in Blind. He plays a police officer in Blind. Um, so as you can see, like all of the things that we work on are very interconnected with working with different people. You know, um, I mean, Thomas Haley, he played the police officer in Blind, but he's also a director as well so he he do, works on just about um he does just about everything as we all do uh when it comes to working in the independent industry you kind of have to wear many hats um so yeah it's there's a lot coming out i mean i if you follow me online instagram facebook i post all the time about upcoming projects i post all the time about uh um trailers all that stuff so you can keep up with me online. Sarah French online is my Instagram and just Sarah French on Facebook. You can find me and I'm always talking about things. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, Sarah, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Good luck on the success of those films, and have a good day. Thank you, you too. Thanks for listening. They're coming to get you, Barbara. This is Carrie. This is Billy. This is Mr. Bo. And we are from a podcast from a Nate. You can catch us every Wednesday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. For the latest news and information on Anthony T's Horror Show, you can check out Anthony T's Horror Show on his social media platforms at Anthony T's Horror Show on Facebook, Instagram, and the Slasher app at Anthony T's on Twitter. Anthony T's Horror Show can be found on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash Anthony Thurber. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com and you can find Anthony T's Horror Show on the web at anthonytshorrorshow.blogspot.com Now, in this edition of what Anthony T is watching, it is a film that I've been wanting to watch for a long time. It has been an anticipated film that I've been wanting to talk about. It's a film I tried to get to last episode. And I was excited for this film for all the wrong reasons. Yes, for all the wrong reasons here. Because when I first heard about Glenn Danzig's Veronica, this film was being compared to Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Now, if you never heard of The Room before, that is one of the worst films ever made. So when I read that Veronica was getting the room type heat. I really needed to check this film out because I really needed to see this film because I really needed to test this film compared to the greatest guilty pleasure film of all time, Jason X. So that was pretty much the only real reason why I had any interest in this film because under no circumstances would I ever watch a film that is compared to Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Now, I did go into this film with an open mind, as like I do with every film I watch, hoping that this would be a very good film, hoping that everybody was just not seeing the film for what it is. Unfortunately, I can say this with such clarity, Glenn Danzig's Veronica is the worst horror anthology film of all time. And this was a film that I was hoping to like, because I have to admit, this film had some very good gothic imagery that's all this film has. Gothic imagery. Because this did not look like it resembled a film. I'll even go far to say this. This looked like a film that is unreleasable. Meaning, it's a film that distributors would never touch. And the only reason... Veronica is being released. It's being released by a record company, Cleopatra Records, who've also dipped into the horror genre by releasing various other horror movies too. But also, Glenn Danzig is one of the artists on the Cleopatra Records music label. If he was some average indie filmmaker, nobody would distribute this film. Because, quite frankly, this film lacks a lot of things. First, 
this film lacks any sense of action. Everything in this film felt like you were watching a painting throughout the entire film. The f Each of the stories moved very slowly and as there was no sense of pacing. There was hardly any action in this film. It's just mind-boggling to watch a film from someone who has never ever made a film in his life. Yes, he's made music videos, but filmmaking is a different animal. And it was like he was just putting anything down in the screenplay and just go from there. Because literally, in a screenplay, you need characters that are interesting. In this film, there is no characters that caught my attention. No characters that grabbed my interest. I don't know what Glenn Danzig was doing when he was writing the screenplay. Because, quite frankly, in order to have a film work and be scary and entertaining, you need characters who have more of a story, more personality. Every character in this film felt very dark and very gloomy. That is not how you make a movie. Another thing that really irked me about this film was the way that Glenn Danzig directs the acting in this film. Because the acting in this film is horrendous. Every actor in that film was just hitting one note. I was not interested in any of the characters. The first story felt very depressing. The second story was very dull. And kind of frankly very lifeless. Because seriously, your main protagonist is dull. Was dull. I cannot get into this, the character. If I can't get into the character, how am I gonna get into the story? And the third one was just completely crap. Seriously. In fact, I'll even go on to say that third story, Drukaja Contessa of Blood, is the worst segment in an anthology film ever. This story had no protagonist. This story felt like it was like a the main character bathes in blood, kills another character, then bathes in blood again. That's what the story felt to me. When you have that in a story, it really kills a film. If you manage to survive the first two stories of this film, Drew Kaija Contessa of Blood will do you in because that was flat out horrible that just focuses on a main villain killing people and that's it because you get no story in that segment in fact this whole film's main problem is that glenn danzig's screenplay does not develop anything it doesn't want you to make you care for the protagonists or even make you care that this is actually a film. Because quite frankly, I've never seen a film, let alone an anthology film, where the screenplay is just non-existent. Because that's what it felt here. Because I really think Glenn Danzig did not even care about making his characters interesting. Instead, he's just going to throw everything on the screen and see what works. And you cannot do that with a film. Just throw out your ideas, throw out your vague stories, and see if it'll work. Don't get me wrong. I like Gene Rowland. I like Jess Franco. But Glenn Danzig is n neither Gene Rowland or Jess Franco. Those guys, at least, through their bizarreness, told a story. Glenn Danzig here just didn't even try to tell a story, as this film feels like 
It's just there for the brutal blood and gore, and that's it. Because there is no attempt to really make this any good. No wonder why this film has, get this, a 1.9 on IMDb. I'll say this again, a 1.9. Veronica is easily the worst film of the year. I don't think there's going to be any other film to top this film because this is quite frankly awful. Now, is this the greatest guilty pleasure film of all time? I don't think so. It will not be the greatest guilty pleasure film of all time. I'm sorry. You need to have action that's moving over the top. This film has little to no action. It felt like I was watching paint dry. And that's why it gets sort of a guilty pleasure title on this film. Because this is how you do not make a film. Because if you're going to have a film where the tone is very dark and bleak in each of your stories. If you're going to have a film where you're going to have acting that is just downright horrible. And if you're going to have a film that really just doesn't want to bring you in. Then that is why Glenn Danzig's Veronica is the room of horror films. Because Glenn Danzig doesn't give you any scares. He doesn't give you any good acting. He doesn't even give you a film in which you can enjoy. Because this film felt like it was made for one person. And that was Glenn Danzig. Because this film is just... Downright awful, amateurish at times, and it's really one of the worst films, quite frankly, that I've seen in quite a while. This is like Battlefield Earth bad. This is like Dead Silence bad. Don't bother wasting your time with Glenn Danzig's Veronica, because either the first segment will get you to shut the film off, the second segment will get you to shut the film off. And if you make it to the worst segment in an anthology horror film ever, you're going to shut it off by the third segment. Because everything in this film is boring. It has great imagery and that's it. It is one of those films where we really need the bad movie police. Because, quite frankly, this film should have never been released at all. It is just a complete and utter mess. See you in January, Glenn Danzig. Couple of other things before I end this podcast. First, on the official website, Anthony T's Horror Show, over at Anthony T's Horror Show dot blogspot dot com. I released my latest rankings for the best films of 2020. And this is shake up in my top five films of 2020. As this is say a couple new films enter the top five. So this is like a major shake up on the whole top five of 2020. And also I will be a guest on Pat's See the Angry Nerds. Shock Bites podcast, as I was a guest along with Steve Van Sampson from Retro Right Dr. Puss and Rice, as we all talk about Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles. Sorry, <laughs> not, it's not a horror film, but it's one of my favorite comedies of all time. Definitely check out that podcast over on various podcasts formats. Also, I can give you a preview of upcoming episodes that you can expect in the month of June. Episode 45, I will be joined with director Paul Ragsdale and producer Angelica D'Alba as we're going to talk about their upcoming film, Slasherette 
Potty, which is currently in post-production. Then, in episode 46, I will be bringing back Philip Perrone onto my podcast, as we're going to talk about our favorite Vinegar Syndrome films, as both me and Philip really love Vinegar Syndrome. So, I've always wanted to do this episode for like a year, and I finally got to doing this episode. So, that will be episode 46. With that, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. Have a good day, stay safe, and support Indie Horror.